The first line of the 2022 documentary Suburban Nightmare that documents the Chris Watts tragedy says, It's a crime that shook us all to the core. Never was there a more accurate statement. The blurry cop style movie poster is simple, showing an image of Watts behind bars. The image is one of his arrest photos, where his eyes look stone cold and dead. Suburban Nightmares feature image lets us know this documentary is going to be explaining why something terrible happened. Me and Papa. Okay, Daddy's not gonna do it if you keep falling off. Papa. He, well, he, he, look in the camera. Right here, look here. Hey, Papa. See? Yes. Yeah. Guys, if you no fall idea. off, we're not gonna do it anymore. Okay. Yeah. Yes. We make it. Watch this. Right out of the gate, this documentary is different than the other documentaries made about this case. An investigator starts off spoon feeding us the most bitter reality when he comments about the horror of, and I quote, shoving your daughter through an eight inch hole. I mean, we don't hear language like that very often especially from a former FBI profiler. The narrator then goes on to say the reality of the Watts family and what happened in this tragedy shattered their carefully curated image. Right from go, we have a documentary that acknowledges the online presence of Shanann Watts and the Watts family was very much smoke and mirrors. It was a staged life, as they say. A lot of the other documentaries made about this family and this tragedy accepted the Facebook and Facebook Live version of the Watts reality to be true. And that just ain't the case, folks. I myself have a background in psychology and applied behavioral analysis. I find the most fascinating, interesting aspects of this case, so to speak, is the dynamics between the various people, the family dynamics, the dynamics between Chris Watts and Nicole Kessinger, the dynamics between Shanann Watts and, you know, a number of people in her life. Suburban Nightmare has psychologists, analysts, and qualified specialists who are able to comment on all things Watts with some insight, intelligence, and informed thinking. I like this. Suburban Nightmare is also keeping it real by featuring people that were actually in the Watts lives, like Neighbor Nate's mom, next door neighbor. Fonda Knox, who also authored the book Beyond Tragedy, and she had a lot to say about her neighbors. And Shanann's high school teacher, who has been mentioned in other documentaries and even appeared on one or two other documentaries. Apparently, Shanann and this gentleman had a pretty close relationship and maintained a friendship after she graduated from high school. Matt Francis was Shanann's drama and theater teacher, which makes him a perfect person to speak about Shanann's younger years for this documentary. It also makes him the perfect person to frame what would become Shanann's adult life as a master of the social media stage. As she grew her business, well, kind of, but more so as she grew her skills as an outstanding social media stager through her ventures with nine different MLM companies, the last being her stint with Lavelle, selling Thrive and the lifestyle that Thrive promised would come along with the products. 
It should be noted that Matt Francis was interviewed and largely quoted in the book, The Perfect Father. Through the pages of this book, Francis recounts hours Shanann spent in Francis's office after school, crying about her reportedly broken home life and what she claimed was a non-existent relationship with her father. It should be noted that after 40 years of marriage, Shanann's parents are still together and have never divorced. Matt told stories about the long hours he would spend coaching Shanann and also relying on her as one of his best stagehands and stage tech managers who he, who he said became a master at staging a scene. It seems by many accounts that Francis did in fact take on a bit of a fatherly role in Shanann's life. When Matt Francis left Shanann Watts High School, Pinebrook, which was a progressive high school focusing on drama, theater, and the arts, Shanann wrote him a heartfelt letter detailing how Francis filled the void her absent father left in her life, or so she claims, and we should remember, this is from her very young perspective. All this talk about theater, drama, and scene staging segues perfectly into what most of the documentary's experts have to say about Shanann and the Watts family. Vonda Knox and local Denver area reporter Stefan Tubbs introduced Frederick, Colorado as a perfect, idyllic setting for a young family to raise their children in which there is no crime and a complete feeling of security. Vonda Knox recounts her interactions with Bella and Celeste as being mostly verbal because their porches were so close to one another. She recounts the greetings from the two little girls when they would shout, hi lady, hi lady, to get her attention and say hello, and she describes them as being adorable little things with affection. Suburban Nightmare introduces us to my very favorite true crime podcaster, Heather Ashley of Big Mad True Crime. I will link her podcast and I recommend you definitely try getting Big Mad as Heather Ashley recounts a number of true crime cases. Heather Ashley notes, there was always so much evidence on Facebook and social media that everything was wonderful. The girls were always put together and Shanann was upbeat talking about how wonderful her husband was. What really got her on her first date was when she had a migraine and Chris let her lay down, Heather explains, on his lap and she woke up three hours later. He didn't move. He didn't judge her. He didn't and he accommodated her needs without being asked. I think this is a great recount of how their relationship began and how Chris won Shanann over. The documentary refers to what has become a classic in Shanann Rusek's history books. The video recorded just months before the murders in which Shanann recounts her struggles before meeting Chris, how their love story began, and how she says, eight years later, we are living in Colorado, we have two kids, and he is the best thing that ever happened to me. So, um... I I feel really blessed this summer. I'm going to San Diego with Chris. We're going um, June 22nd through the 26th. No, the 26th we come home at 1.30 in the morning. And then the 26th, that afternoon at 5.30 at night, Bella, Cece, Bella, Cece, and I and my dad are flying back to North Carolina for six weeks. Six weeks we're going to be in North Carolina, Cece, right? And um, we're going to go spend time with our families. In this narrative, Shanann recounts feeling horribly while she looked perfectly fine on the outside, expressing the feeling of being misunderstood by virtually everyone around her. She discusses quitting her job and being diagnosed with what she refers to in this video as being health challenges. Psychologist and author of My Daddy is My Hero, Lena Durhali, takes us back 10 years in Shanann's history. She comments on Shanann's May 2010 lupus diagnose and meeting Chris Watts soon after. Durhali says she went through a really dark time in her life previously and she was really unhappy. She goes on to explain how Chris Watts helped turn things around for Shanann. Shanann's former theater teacher, Matt Francis, gives us some insight into what he saw in a young Shanann Watts in saying, 
Shanann was definitely driven as a person, and it came from a deep down desire to get out of her own holes and hard places in life. And I got a friend suggestion, friend request from Chris. <laughs> I was in a really, really, really bad place. And I got a friend, su- friend request from Chris on Facebook, and I was like, oh, what the heck, I'm never gonna meet him, except. Well, one thing led to another, and eight years later, we have two kids, we live in Colorado, and he's the best thing that has ever happened to me. Something I really like about Suburban Nightmare as a documentary is that it takes into account more pieces or dynamics than many other documentaries. It's been my opinion that many previously released documentaries dance around the issue of MLMs and the demand they put on a person, who they target, and the impact that they have on the participant and their family. This documentary highlights the MLM component or the Thrive dynamic more than any other. The FBI profiler introduces the heavy demands Thrive made on Shanann's life and says, because of her job, online sales, Shanann is regularly posting. She's a huge Facebook person. She's got a lot of followers. Every day, basically, her life is on Facebook and it all looks great. Matt Francis, Shanann's former teacher, takes a Shanann-friendly perspective and notes that, She really saw a connection with what she could do online, making sales and revenue, but also, and more importantly, really and truly helping other people create a better lives for themselves, really a better identity. Clinical psychologist Rebecca Asse is part of the featured panel for this documentary, and she says, maybe it did start out as a way to keep her family in the loop and it grew from there. We're not really sure what her motivation was, but we can see very clearly from her behavior that Shanann, for some reason, felt the need to constantly keep everyone in the loop. Psychotherapist and author of Mommy Burnout, Cheryl Ziegler, makes an astute observation about the way we tend to present things, the way Shanann tended to present her life on social media. I think that was the intention. Let me invite you into my very normal life, into my very happy life that we can all connect on. This is what the dangers of social media are. All you have to do is capture a minute or two of smiling faces to convince the world of something. Maybe everything is okay. Maybe it's not okay. She points out the disconnect that we see happening right before our eyes. The Shanann envisioned things would play out in a certain way, but then we see in reality, it's much different. Matt Francis looks at Chris's reaction on a deeper level. He says, you could tell when Chris came in with the announcement that he had a very hard time reacting the way she was hoping he would react. When you look at his mannerisms, there are signs that there was a lot of frustration there. The panel more or less unanimously points out the irony in Chris Watts' lackluster response to Shanann Watts' pregnancy announcement. Overweight at the time of his wedding, Chris lost 60 pounds over the past couple of years. My girl, Heather Ashley of Big Mad True Crime, points out, he was using the products that she sold. We do know that working out with his shirt off would be good for Shanann's business. Another panelist notes on the flip side, we do know that on the social media side of things, Shanann seemed to be happy with his physique. Lena Durholly, who has studied the family dynamics and this story intently concludes that he started caring about his macros and his diet. He became more objectively attractive to women as he lost weight and bulked up. So there's lots of women commenting on the male condition here. What does local Denver area journalist Safan Tubbs have to say? He says, well, you can look at it one of two ways. He's either working out for all of the right reasons or probably a story that has played out millions of times in our country. He is wanting to look better for somebody else. Documentary Suburban Nightmare.
documents the beginning of the search for the 15-week pregnant mother and her two young daughters, beginning with her friend Nicole Atkinson's call to 911 to the quickly growing urgency that brought CBI and the FBI on board very quickly. As the investigation is barely deepening, investigators learn that the Watts family is over $70,000 in debt and their homeowners association is suing them for unpaid dues. Frayed edges and broken pieces of the Watts family life are starting to show now that the carefully staged presentation of the Watts life a la social media has come to a halt. The panel points out that Chris Watts is not the one who is running the household or any aspect of their lives together. In fact, as one FBI profiler points out, Shanann is running him. The documentary focuses on a time period that is about a day and a half after Shanann and her two girls disappeared from their home. The intense investigation leads investigators to quickly realize that there are two Watts families, the one online and the one that exists in reality. When investigators gain access to Shanann's cell phone, they realize a couple had been spending time apart over the last few weeks, with Shanann and the girls visiting family in North Carolina and Chris supposedly holding down the fort in Colorado. The documentary panel notes Chris's inattention to Shanann during the weeks the couple was separated and with his complete lack of attention to Shanann, the narrator says that Shanann seems to post more while she is away. Well, we do know from studying this case for a few years that that is not necessarily true. Shanann's post actually slowed down while she was in North Carolina and started to pick back up again only a few days before her life was tragically ended. In the spirit of universal wisdom, Cheryl Ziegler laments, there's a reason why people put posts out there, whether it's conscious or not. You're seeking praise, you're seeking validation, you're seeking relatableness, connection. Maybe you're lonely. There's something that you're seeking when you put it out there. What social media follower Jessica Shelton represents one of the many of Shanann's growing pool of followers and Facebook fans. Jessica Shelton openly comments on the relatability in Shanann Watt's Facebook posts and the connection she feels to Shanann, although she does not know her in person. Jessica says, oh my gosh, you really felt like you were her friend or her family or even maybe that you lived with her. I mean, she recorded everything, posted everything, took photos of everything. Matt Francis hypothesizes that Shanann started using social media as her outlet to forget some of the things that were happening at home. Regardless of the perspective from which one senses a connection with Shanann and the relatable family, what is crystal clear is that Shanann and her family connected with a far reach on a normal day. And when Shanann, Bella, and Cece went missing, the energy of their ability to connect was set ablaze across the United States and even further. People tuned in to what was happening in the hearts of thousands, maybe millions of people had a beat in this one. Hey, Jen. Okay. So Chris, this is the lemon meringue. No, that's Daddy's. Here's yours. Wait, don't hit. Wait, wait, wait. Here, Bella. The connection that Shanann created with others was all the more reason for the public outrage elevated to a piercing crescendo when it was observed, then became known that Watts appeared to have little interest in finding his family. Vonda Knox talks about Watts viewing the security camera footage from her son, Neighbor Nate System, pointing out that he is well out of his comfort zone, highlighting that when the police said he could go, Chris Watts bolted out the door. Former FBI profiler Mark Serafik gives insight into the police officer thinking and possible investigative tactics. 
as he says, the police officer, quote, sort of defended Chris when neighbor Nate let him know that something is not right. The panel gives a review of the interview from the porch that will go down in history books. The consensus with them is the same as it was with the entire world when that interview from the porch aired live. Something is not right and more alarming. Something is definitely wrong. No, but if somebody has her and they're not safe, like I want them back now. Like that, that, that's what's in my head. Like if they're safe right now, they're going to come back. But if they're not safe right now, that's what that's the not knowing part. Like if they're not safe, I, I, last night I was I had every light in the house on. I was hoping that I would just get just ran over by the kids running in the door and just like barrel rushing me. But it didn't happen. And it was just a traumatic night trying to be here. Local Denver area reporter Stefan Tubbs remembers that people were calling his show in tears, incredibly upset. He says that many people had prayed for Chris Watts himself, unable to imagine what it would be like to be missing your pregnant wife and two very young and by all accounts adored children. While some hearts bled for Chris Watts, others particularly those accustomed to working with people in the midst of unthinkable tragedy, have their reservations. Reminiscing back to Watts' interview with FBI Special Agent Coder in the earliest days of the investigation and the evidence found in Shanann's phone with her text messages between herself and close friends, law enforcement is tipped off that Watts is having an affair. When investigators start to speak with Shanann's friends, they are made aware of a number of specific problems within the marriage. Headlining these events is the event that has adopted the name Nutgate. In this documentary's narrative, the argument between Cindy Watts, Chris's mother, and his wife Shanann is admittedly a core issue, or perhaps it could be said that Nutgate signifies a key problem in Chris and Shanann's marriage tension between Chris's family and Shanann and his new family with his children. When Shanann and the girls are missing for two days, investigators have come to the conclusion that she didn't run off with the kids. This, in the real crime timeline, is at the time Chris sits down with Colorado Bureau of Investigation's Tammy Lee to take a polygraph exam. The former FBI profiler lets us in on some secrets and a well-known tell among experienced investigators. He explains that a polygraph exam is not detecting lies, but rather truthfulness, establishing a baseline for truth and detecting divergence from this baseline of truth to indicate deception. I never had heard this before and I found it to be very interesting. This is much the way we determine a learning disability or behavioral personality diagnosis in my line of work by observing the norm or baseline across a variety and range of settings over time and then observing again over a variety and range of settings over time a person's behaviors and then assessing whether or not the behaviors are socially adaptive or maladaptive. Sarah Freak goes on to note that when they ask the really difficult questions of Chris, the ones when one could reasonably expect a parent to show emotion for his children and missing wife, Chris is stone cold and dry eyed. The former FBI profiler tells us of this not so quiet secret that investigators have this thing, this saying, when there's not snot, you're in trouble. Meaning, a parent of a missing child is going to be an absolute torrential hot mess of tears and tissues in agony over their missing beloved child. My God, can you imagine? He explains that investigators know what's up and that what they really need is for Chris to explain the facts, to to establish the facts as he knows them in order to uncover the truth. Additionally, Watts, of course, bombs the polygraph itself. With a failing score of negative four, Chris Watts scores an exceptional negative 18, scoring deceptive on all questions except for recognizing his own name. 
The panel points out more recent and epic failures in Chris Watts' life. Not only did he fail his attempt to pass the polygraph exam, and miserably, he failed in living up to the expectations as a man, a husband, and a father in the home. He failed as a provider and caretaker. Watts fails miserably as his wife controls the home, the children, the bills, and the books, even if her accounting and budgeting skills have proven to be subpar. She calls the shots. She speaks on their behalf. And as Chris Watch watched money disappear from the bank account to the tune of $70,000 in debt and rapidly counting, not only did he not do anything about it, more than one documentary panelist points out that he was clueless in understanding the problem and blind, deaf, and dumb when it came to offering any type of solution. Being a man in control of his life doesn't come easy for Watts. Truth doesn't come easy for Watts either, and this is becoming abundantly clear. Author of My Daddy is My Hero, Lena Durhali, talks about the exceedingly pleasant reputation Watts has enjoyed for what seems to be his entire life. For a man who has only encountered people who speak well of him during his entire life, as many law enforcement and also people on this panel concede, he is one flawed man when it comes to owning up to his actions. Finally, at minute marker 50, we hear Watts crumble under the pressure of Tammy Lee and Graham Coder's questioning as he calmly states, I cheated on her. 50 minutes into the documentary. Lena Durhali is not fooled by Watts' technique. She says, after he fails a polygraph, he's going to change the story around. Like, okay, I lied to you, but I lied because I'm having an affair. Ha ha. The narrator points out that the investigators already knew he was having an affair and that she came to law enforcement herself. What will this documentary smart panel have to say about the mistress? Featured is the grainy and noise not reduced first interview Miss Kessinger held with law enforcement, her dad, and her dog at a public park near her home on August 15, 2018, two days after Chris Watts' family went missing. We find out that for the last two months, Ms. Kessinger has been having an affair with Watts. The first topic broached after the grainy interview snippets is the secret calculator app, and Lena Durhali explains its uses. The featured commentators are not snarky when talking about Watts' mistress, but it's hard to not talk about Ms. Nicole Kessinger without an edge to the tongue. FBI profiler Safarik says they made no bones about it, at least with each other. Taking trips to the sand dunes, this guy was really rolling the dice. My girl, my favorite true crime podcaster, Heather Ashley, Big Mad True Crime, is at her best when commenting about Kessinger in this documentary. She says they were very emotionally involved. They were invested with each other. They felt like they were soulmates, like they finally found their person. Chris gets this amazing opportunity to live out his fantasy with his new girlfriend when his wife decides to stay in North Carolina for six weeks. He had this bachelor life with this girl who has this totally different vibe than Shanann. I think Kessinger had this damsel vibe about her. She didn't have any kids, and she was kind of a do-over. Chris could kind of swoop in and save her, and he got to be everything for her that he wasn't in his marriage. Whoa, but you know, touche. Of the grainy audio interview clips, we hear Kessinger assuring law enforcement that she thought Watts was getting separated and divorced, and that she did not know that his wife was 15 weeks pregnant or pregnant at all. She was just disgusted by it. Nicole Kessinger told the police that she had absolutely no idea Shanann was pregnant and she was just sick about it when she found out and that's why she went to the police. FBI profiler Safarik 
is sold on Kessinger's story, unbelievably. He says, Nicole was completely led on. He lied to her throughout the affair, like he lied to the media every time he came out, and like he lied to law enforcement, for that matter. He goes on to emphasize that police are saying, oh, Chris, we know that you killed your family, and he reacts in no way that any of us would if we were accused of killing anyone, let alone our most beloved in life. He's just kind of like, oh, no, I, I didn't do that. So like moving on and, and chit chat. It's very bizarre. Those of us who have heard the interview audio know it's bizarre. And the commentators in this documentary made a really good point about it. This video could continue on for hours upon hours were I to comment on all the gamesmanship played by both Chris Watts and his mistress as they tried to sidestep the rapidly growing hole they each had one foot in. And the way the experts on this great panel characterized, criticized, and captioned the duo's shady maneuvers. Let's hope Watts will move towards speaking the complete truth about what happened to his family in August of 2018, as this video also needs to move towards completion. So let's look at the next big step Suburban Nightmare documents as it examines how this tragedy unfurled to the world. From a couple different angles, the experts and Suburban Nightmare's guests arrive at a breaking point in the case when Watts gave his partial and partially truthful confession. Vonda Knox recounts the heaviness that fell from the sky when Watts confessed and the world realized Shanann and the girls were not coming back. I'm sure all that knew the family personally were shaken to the core. It's hard to imagine the shock and horror. Former FBI profiler narrates the details of introducing Ronnie Watts into the interrogation, or was it an interview? Lena Terhali also speaks about the unorthodox move to allow Ronnie to be in the interview room with his son, Chris Watts, while investigators were trying to get a confession or at least enough information from Watts to locate and recover the bodies of the victims. Lena Derhali and a couple of other psychologists present a picture of Chris as being a person who values his image and others' opinion of him. Lena says, Chris Watts' whole persona was crafted around this idea of being the perfect father and husband. She notes that now he gets to be seen as the victim. This poor man who lost his wife and his daughters. She proposes that this is where the alternative question, which is part of the read technique, comes into play. It's not surprising that the psychologists on the Suburban Nightmare panel lean towards this explanation as to how and why a confession was coaxed out of Chris Watts. The read technique is a highly psychological maneuver. It's nine step scaffolding is constructed to get an investigator to the end result they need in a reasonable amount of time. As investigators pull a pathetic and partial and practically fully untrue confession out of Watts, Vonda Knox appears emotional when she recounts his initial confession that blamed Shanann for taking the girls' lives. And with intensity, she tells us of that horrific sadness that overcame the world hot, hot. when Watts gave any confession. It's hot, okay. This meant the girls and Shanann were not coming back. Suburban Nightmare did an excellent job of selecting the key moments and interactions in the interrogation room, the exchanges between Special Agent Coder, Tammy Lee, and Chris Watts that conveyed the tension, terror, and trepidation that existed in those tenuous moments on that tragic day. I've consumed so much media and narrative about the Watts case, and this ensemble touched my heart on a deeper level than most. Clinical psychologist Rebecca Osei asked the question, 
when Chris Watts finally broke down, finally, after days of his entire family and life being missing, or while well, hey, he knew they were gone. For days, Chris Watts held up without a single tear, for days, knowing his family was no longer on this earth. When he finally shed tears and broke emotion, when he was confessing in the most cowardly way, Osei questions who his tears were really for. Were they for his family or for himself, knowing that now his new reality is this, that he will be seen as this person for the rest of his life. Lena Dahali comments on how this false confession will forever reflect on Shanann and her memory, which is a true travesty and injustice. If a tough beast reality knows with Chris Watts and thinks Shanann was a, a tough wife to live with, and he further notes that Chris Watts' false confession will solidify their opinion of Shanann Watts forever. As we move towards the closing scenes of Suburban Nightmare, an intense scene in which Special Agent Coder and Chris Watts are back and forth. Coder tries desperately, but with skill, to get any and all information from Watts that he is willing to give. Watts says with little emotion, I am not a monster. I did not kill my baby girls. The narrator pipes in to let all viewers of Suburban Nightmare know that looking at the evidence, investigators are convinced that he is in fact a monster, a specific type, a family annihilator. Rebecca Osei comments that family annihilators in general are male and they're in their 30s. She says there are things about them that are similar like family annihilations often happen in the late summer they often happen on the weekend she says there's a number of correlations between when and who commits family annihilation as far as why that goes back to stressors the stressors are finance affairs can be another FBI profiler Mark Safarik lends his expertise on this very specific type of personality in saying, for most family annihilators, it is an event that is thought out. It is planned. If not for months, then at least for days or weeks in advance. He said that when Shannon and the girls went to North Carolina, this was it for Chris. He's like, this has got to happen. He's spending all of his time with Nicole Kessinger, and he thinks to himself, this is the relationship I want. This is the life I want. Lena Derhali hits us with the sad reality of Chris's warped mind in saying that he simply no longer had a use for Shanann now that he found his new woman. This breaks my heart. She explains that in the world of narcissism, there's a term used called discard. The narcissist is done with someone when that person no longer has value to the narcissist. They are discarded. This, my friends, was a literal discard in the absolute most horrendous way. So in this large section of my notes, as I create this video for you, uh, my notes start out saying um, that in the spirit of universal wisdom, Cheryl Ziegler laments. <laughs> and throughout this documentary, Suburban Nightmare, I think that she offered some grounded and practical wisdom and advice, as did all of the psychologists and clinicians and just people who participated in this documentary. So, author of Mommy Burnout, Cheryl Ziegler, once again injects some universal wisdom and practical wisdom or advice that we could all benefit from listening to. Nodding to the title of her book, she says, Burnout is a real thing. Is it a coincidence that we are now in a mental health epidemic? Is it a coincidence that there are epidemic levels of anxiety and depression? 
she connects this epidemic crisis of the mind, the human spirit, with smartphones and being connected all the time, looking at your screen, rather than looking into the eyes of a person you are getting to know, someone you love, or just, you know, someone you got to interact with throughout the day, rather than a computer and a robot. Social media adds to the pressure people have to perform every day to look better than what is realistic in their lives. We all have struggles and struggles are normal and even healthy. They build who you are. Social media adds pressure to be perfect and to show your best self all the time. Rebecca Osei was big in delivering that message throughout this entire documentary, and I really appreciate the message that she and Cheryl Ziegler and Lena Darhali and Heather Ashley of Big Mad True Crime and everyone else had to cast off to us, hopefully, you know, for the better good. This is one of the most horrific, horrendous, and egregious crimes that anybody can remember ever. We can only hope that a tiny little bit of good, maybe even a decent amount of good, or, you know, some good that goes a long way can come out of this horrific tragedy. It's hard to imagine, but the ripple effect is in effect. And every choice we make, every action we take, every word we speak ripples out and has an effect that we could never even imagine. Thank you for your lessons and for your messages, Shanann. I know that you would be happy to know that so many people are learning because of the way you lived and what you put out there on social media. We all appreciate you and we hope that you, Bella, Cece, and Nico are joyfully laughing and relaxing in eternal peace.